afternoon. I'm Robin Prusner with the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship, and I am the hemp administrator for the state of Iowa. So we're going to talk today um, about the first legal hemp season in Iowa here in 2020. So first, let's start with uh, what is hemp? So to be very, very clear to everybody, hemp is cannabis sativa. Um, there is no difference uh, other than chemically of hemp between marijuana. You can't look at a plant and say that's definitely hemp or that's definitely marijuana. It all boils down to the amount of Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, or we call it THC, and that is the compound that gives people that psychedelic or oftentimes called high sensation. If cannabis is hemp, it has a THC content of no more than three tenths of percent on dry matter basis. Also, let's set the stage for uh, something that could be confusing if you talk with hemp growers from other states. Iowa is operating under the 2018 Farm Bill, and so hemp is defined as that 0.3% THC. However, we are also required to do those official tests using post-decarboxylation, fancy language for um, heat is applied during the testing. What that does is that it takes the, the THC acid and it converts it into Delta 9. So we call the, um, in Iowa under the 2018 Farm Bill, it's total THC, where there are some other states that are only on Delta 9 THC. So bottom line, hemp has less than three-tenths a percent of total THC plus a measurement uncertainty. Let's talk about measurement uncertainty. In 2020, our laboratory calculated our measurement uncertainty as being um, 0.09% or nine one hundredths of a percent. Measurement uncertainty is a lot like your bathroom scale compared to your doctor's scale. You may say, think to yourself, my bathroom scale is within a pound or two of my doctor's scale that is more official and more sensitive. So measurement uncertainty is really looking at every piece of equipment that we use in that analytical process and seeing kind of how much wiggle room it has. Um, and then all of that is added together and it comes up with our measurement uncertainty. That gives us a bit of a wiggle room then with our ultimate amount of allowable THC. So you add that nine one hundredths of a percent onto the 0.3 and you come up with that hard line in Iowa of 0.39% total THC passes. So if you have that or less, then your cannabis passes as hemp. It is possible that that measurement uncertainty number will change from year to year. We are in the process of trying to determine what that's going to be in 21. So stay tuned for that. So in Iowa, hemp has 0.39% total THC or less. So as I mentioned before, Iowa is operating on the 2018 Farm Bill that requires us to measure the total THC. That's the sum of the Delta 9 THC plus the THC acid. States that came into hemp under the 2014 Farm Bill are only held to having to measure their Delta 9 THC. That was supposed to sunset um, in October of 20. However, at the very last minute, Congress extended that. And so there are many states that are still operating under the 14 Farm Bill, again, for 2021. It should sunset this year. They are only held to the Delta 9 content, where Iowa is held to the total THC content. When people are thinking about growing hemp, the first thing I tell them they need to do is they need to first figure out what actual hemp crop they intend to grow. Um, with corn and soybeans, what we're accustomed to in Iowa, you grow corn and then you can sell it as animal feed, you can sell it as ethanol, you can sell it to a corn chip factory. Um, hemp kind of throws that on its head. Depending on the type of hemp you want to grow, you're gonna grow it differently. So you need to decide upfront. Are you growing grain for human consumption? Are you going to grow seed, which is for propagation? Do you grow it for fiber? Or are you growing it for cannabidiol? Oftentimes people call that CBD or other cannabinoids such as CBG. 
And then um, another crop that is legal in other states but not legal in Iowa is smokable. And it is grown um, the same as you would grow for the cannabidiol. Um, however, in June of 2020, the governor signed House File 2581. That made smokable illegal, retroactively actually, saying it was actually illegal back to April 8th. And that was the day that Iowa was approved to go forward with hemp by the USDA. So when you're gonna grow hemp as a crop, you need to make a decision on, are you going to plant what people call clones or cuttings, or, or are you going to plant seed, which we're more accustomed to here in row crop country? So clones or cuttings are taken from female plants. That is usually for that cannabidiol crop because you want all female plants when growing for cannabidiol or smokable. Um, people who are growing for grain seed fiber, they plant or they drill seed. It's roughly 50-50 male to female generally. However, I have also seen people plant seed when they are growing for cannabidiol and that seed has either been feminized um, or some people are not feminizing and they're going forward with males and females in the field. So a year in an outdoor grow here in the state of Iowa is very similar to all of our other row crops, except for up front, you have to actually apply for a hemp license or permit. You are required to submit fingerprints for that official background check and we need to send those to the FBI and get that background check back. You cannot have any drug-related felonies in the last 10 years um, in order to get a hemp license in the state of Iowa. Hemp is a warm season crop, likes warm soils, and so you're probably gonna plant later than what you typically plant for corn and soybeans. And then when you're approaching harvest, you have to request that official sample and testing so that we can give you the green light to harvest that hemp crop and sell it. Quick overview, if you're not familiar with some of the important uh, regulations that are attached to hemp here in the state of Iowa. In Iowa, a person may not have equitable or legal interest in more than 40 acres. So uh, any person who has more than 5% of that legal or equitable interest in that hemp crop is required to submit those official fingerprints and fill out an application. We then track everybody and keep track of the acres that they're associated with. USDA put a requirement in that said key participants, which they defined as chief executive officer, chief operating officer, chief financial officer of a business are also required to submit fingerprints and be listed on that hemp license. In Iowa, it is not legal to grow in a dwelling so that means not in your house, nor any temporary or permanent structure attached to your house. We're trying to make this a commodity crop um, and move it out of that marijuana realm. In your license application, we ask you to describe how you may wish to destroy your crop. And yes, I said destroy. So if you do have a hemp crop that is above that 0.39% total THC, we are required by law to mandate the destruction of that crop. I call this the triangle of tragedy or triumph because the decision and approval of how you wish to destroy your crop will be a consensus agreement between you, the licensee, between the Iowa Department of Agriculture and local law enforcement. We work with your sheriff. So we all have to come to agreement if you're gonna burn it, if you're gonna till it under, if you're gonna mow it um, and make sure that everybody is okay with that. Throughout the growing season, licensees are required to submit mandatory reports, including telling us when you planted. You need to give us that pre-harvest notification so that we can come out and do that official sample and test. You need to also report when you're done harvesting. If you destroyed your crop, either voluntarily or mandated, you'll need to let us know about that. And finally, if you do get a felony drug conviction, during um, a license period, you are also required to tell us. I've talked a little bit about that official sampling and testing. Um, at the time of license application, you will pay $1,000 for uh, sampling and testing. That will cover your first sample. 
If you grow multiple varieties, each variety must be tested separately. Um, there is a pricing schematic on whether we can test all of those varieties on the same trip or separately. You get a discount when we can test more at one time. If you are unfortunate and have a high THC content in your crop, uh, USDA does not allow us to go back out to that field and grab another sample. We can, however, retest that retained sample that we took um, officially out there in the field the first time uh, for an additional fee. And we did actually have six times in the 2020 growing season when applicants took that route when they had a hot crop. Our sampling procedures, we will take two inches or so from at least 10 plants, unless you have less than 10 plants, um, and all the way up to at least 36 plants if you do have 40 acres of the same variety. USDA mandates that within that, after you, we do that official sample, you have 15 days to harvest. So the day that we come out and we take that sample, we call that day zero and the clock starts and you have until the end of day 15 to get it harvested. If it is not harvested, it will actually have to be retested before you can continue harvesting. We do give people what we call a temporary harvest and transportation permit when we're there and we take that sample so that you can immediately begin harvesting it and taking it to the location where you wish to dry it so that you don't have to wait for our test to come back. That's just a brief overview of some of the regulations. I often get asked about what different license types are here in the state of Iowa. You can be a single applicant or a single licensee if you own 96% or more of all legal and equitable interest in that crop. If you have investors or partners where people have 5% or more legal or equitable interest, then we call it a multi a multiple applicant, and that's every applicant needs to submit those official fingerprints for that background check. There is an association license. A good example of that would be the Iowa Crop Improvement Association. If they get in the business of doing crop testing, they would seek an association license, and there would be one person then that is what we call the authorized representative or that one person that we're going to have a bulk of the communication with about the activities with that license. Finally, we do have a university or institution of higher learning license, and we actually do have one community college that had a license in 2020 and did grow a crop as a part of an education program in Eastern Iowa. So let's look at the 2020 growing season by the numbers. Uh, we had a deadline May 15th. If you wished to grow outdoors, you had to have your license application into us. And that's because it does take time to send those fingerprints up to the FBI and get those background checks back. Going forward, 2021 and forward, that deadline for outdoor grow is actually April 15th. Um, it was extended in 2020 because of the late start. So we had 81 license applications in as of May 15th. And by the end of 2020, we actually had issued 86 licenses. For reasons I can't explain, we did have one license that was withdrawn and another license application paid for their license, but then actually didn't finish the process. Total acres licensed in 2020 was 733. We received planting notifications for 680 acres. Keep it in mind that we did have people that had establishment issues with their crop and so they replanted and so those acres would have been counted twice for each time they planted. We actually had over 2 million square feet that was applied for, um, but however, just a little over 2,000 of those indoor square feet were actually planted this last year. And that brought us up to a total number of 48 counties that had one or more hemp licenses with them. So let's talk about the type of hemp crops that were grown, or at least we received uh, planting notifications on in 2020. We had roughly 16 acres that were uh, planted for clones, cuttings, or seed starts. So then those plants would be taken out of the greenhouse and then transplanted to a field. 
we had just a little under 250 acres for CBD. However, I do have another other category there where um, mostly people reported that their other acreage was for biomass, which means it was harvested for extraction of a, ca of a cannabinoid of some type. And that would be another 264 acres there. 128 acres were planted for grain, little under 50 for seed, 14 acres for fiber. And then we were in a very uncomfortable situation where when license applications started, smokable had not been outlawed yet. And so we had license applications where they had predicted they were going to grow a total of 21 acres for smokable. Once the governor signed that bill and smokable was outlawed, we worked with our licensees to have them direct that smokable crop into other uses. You may notice that if you add all those numbers up, they don't fit real well into that 680 acres planted. Um, and that's because these were estimates that were made on um, the application. They may have changed their mind. They gave us planting notifications, but then crops may have been destroyed and then replanted to a different type of crop. And so it was very fluid throughout the year in terms of what type of hemp crops were being grown in Iowa. Additionally, we had uh, 13 plantings of various sizes that were voluntarily destroyed. And that was because maybe they had poor germination, they had a lot of weed competition issues, they had a poor stand, or maybe they were doing private testing and determined that they were not going to be able to meet that THC maximum. And so they uh, requested voluntary destruction. It was very common for people to request a license for more acres than what they actually planted. Great example of someone who had gotten a license for 17 acres, but then actually only planted less than one. And then we had 16 instances where the official samples um, tested over 0.39% and we had to issue destruction orders um, for substantial acreage, actually, uh, that unfortunately happened in 2020. We ran a total of 129 lab tests, where 123 were initial tests, and then we had those retests that were requested when samples ran hot with a 13% overall failure rate for THC, which was actually a lot lower than I thought it was going to be. I was hearing reports in other states of um, more than 50% of their acres were testing over the THC content. So while no one wants to be in that group of 13%, um, that was actually a lot lower than what I had um, thought may happen. So if you plot out these official test results um, with that red line being that 0.39% THC, you can see a bulk of them were below that THC content, but that plot to me kind of looks like a mess. But when you put the trend line in, that's what really speaks to me. So the longer hemp stays in the field growing, the higher and higher your THC concentration in your plant climbs. So people have to be very careful when they're timing their harvest. I cannot say this enough that all licensees should be taking samples from the minute their plants start flowering, sending them to private labs to track where their THC is at. Um, in some research done at the University of Kentucky and Cornell, they are finding some hemp varieties are reaching their THC threshold only two weeks after flowering. There are other varieties that can go out six or more weeks and they haven't yet reached that THC concentration maximum. So you really have to know your variety and I think it is so important at this point in time, so early in the development of this crop that you need to be testing or you're gonna find yourself over the line and that entire crop needs to be destroyed. So let's shift gears a little bit and take a look at what it really looked like in Iowa in 2020. So a lot of people picture this as hemp. They think about that feral hemp, oftentimes we call it ditch weed, that that's what a hemp crop should look like. However, here is a picture of a hemp crop in Iowa that was um, taken at an operation that does uh, indoor and outdoor grow in a greenhouse. And you can see that those look like big, beautiful Christmas trees. And then it's also possible for hemp to look like this when you're growing for grain and fiber. 
And this picture was taken in Wisconsin in 2019. So let's look at case study number one. This was our very first field that we received a request for that official sample and testing. And when we went to the field, we were struck a little speechless. This is not what we thought we were gonna see. Um, as you can see, we had a hard time sometimes finding the hemp in the field. So we took that sample and the THC content came back at 0.77%. And remember, the threshold that thou shall not pass is 0.39. And so this was um, an eye-opening moment for everybody involved. This particular crop, um, same crop, different view, was a what's called a 75-day autoflower. So you'll hear people talk about autoflower versus photoperiod sensitive. Autoflower is probably more like we're accustomed to with corn. We have a 95-day corn. Um, autoflower is not driven by the amount of sunlight during the day. It is just purely 75 days out. Most hemp planted in Iowa is photoperiod sensitive meaning once the days start getting shorter after the summer solstice, that's what kicks that plant into flowering. So taken directly off the company website, it shows the company had predicted a total THC in this variety of maybe 0.36%, and it tested 0.77. When I also looked farther into that particular variety, it looks like it had only been field tested in 2019 um, in the United States. It was roughly half what feminized seed costs on a per seed basis. Um, I would be very concerned looking at this when you've got a variety that's only been grown in the field for one year and it's being predicted to be that close to the 0.39% THC. That same variety was planted on another farm and we were called pretty quickly after the test results came back on that first one and asked to come and sample this. This seed had been planted later and those plants were very small. You can see here, we're looking at a four inch plant. I think if I'm generous, there beside the bypass pruner stuck in the ground. Because of the concerns of how high the THC ran in that first crop, um, the producers or the grower here took the opportunity to kind of divide their field up into three lots so that if maybe one would test over the limit, hopefully the others wouldn't. So when we divided that up and we took those tests of these very small plants, we did find THC content that was below the 0.39%. Uh, however, your plants are so small at this point in time, you're not gonna get a lot of dry matter out of it. Um, very interesting, um, something we just had not expected to see out in the field this year. So let's interrupt the case studies and let's take a quick test. Um, when we go to a field to do the official sample, we are frequently asked, hey, how does my crop look? And we quickly learn to maybe not make comment about that. Um, here is an example, same location, shortly after the derecho, and they, have, they were growing two different varieties. And you can see um, Lane, who is in the green wetsuit there, is a little over six feet tall. So that gives you an idea on the size of the plants. And if you had walked onto this site and you looked at both of those varieties, and if you had to guess as to which one had the highest THC or cannabidiol content, what would you say? Well, it turns out that the smaller plants had 0.28% THC, so they were under the 0.39, that's great. Um, you probably expect to see them big bushy plants to go higher. Actually, those big bushy plants ran a three one hundredths of a percent of THC. So for many people, um, it's a hard lesson to learn. Visually, there is nothing you can do to look at a hemp plant and know where it's at on the spectrum in terms of THC and that cannabidiol content. So let's look at case study number two, um, large acreage in central Iowa. And when we went out to do that official test, this is what we saw. So let me explain. If you look over on the left side of your screen, that tall plant is actually a female plant coming into flowering. And right in the middle of the screen, you can see a plant that looks like it's more uh, white. That is a male plant that is in full pollen shed at this point in time. 
This crop was planted for cannabidiol, so we were completely surprised to see um, about 50% of the field in flowering males because the industry standard is, is that you don't want those plants to be pollinated. Once pollinated, the plant stops putting its energy into making that cannabidiol, and instead it puts its energy into seed production. Just another picture of the field, female plant in the forefront. You can see all of the males in the background. So that day we were asked to officially sample two fields in this area of substantial acreage. And the first field came in at 0.37. So two one hundredths below that 0.39 threshold just eked in on 39 acres. However, the other 22 acres tested at 0.45% THC. This was one of the six retests and it came back exactly the same 0.45% the second time we tested it. So those 22 acres had to be destroyed. We had an appointment to come back a week later and test the two remaining fields. There we had 30 acres that tested um, over a half of a percent of THC as well as that fourth field of 15 acres. So in all, those three fields that exceeded the THC content had to be destroyed. And this is actually how the producer chose to do it, and it worked really well. Two passes of a stalk chopper, so the first pass was pretty high, turned around, came back, dropped it, and we really did have um, a nice breakdown of those plants. So first pass, pretty much knocked it over. Second class grounded up pretty well, as you can see there. And within 24 hours, that biomass had really dried down in the field. The key here is that it's made non-retrievable. Uh, that is an important word to law enforcement where we don't want the ability for people, even though after it's been destroyed, to be able to go out and get it and uh, use it for nefarious uses. The stalks on those large plants are substantial. As you can see here by the size eight and a half boot, um, that, that's a big stalk that's left in the field. And that is why it is so hard to break these plants down and um, uh, things like chop them and mow them. Case study number three was less than 10 acres. And in this case, um, the hemp licensee had contracted with a farmer to grow the hemp for them. It was very, very weedy. What we were told was that that farmer landowner said, I am gonna mow these weeds off, and they did. However, they didn't call us for that official sample and test first. So this is, um, it had already been mowed by the time we found out about it and went out to look at it. In this case, because it had not been pre-harvest sampled, that field um, could not be used for any hemp uses. So that hemp was further mowed down into small pieces, though I will tell you, it was actually very difficult to find hemp in the field. It was mostly weeds. And this was an ongoing theme throughout the growing season because there are no labeled herbicides for hemp. So weed control is gonna be one of your biggest challenges and you're gonna have to think outside of the box from what we're accustomed doing here in the state of Iowa. So let's look at the last little case example field. Beautiful field, um, five to six foot tall plants. Um, nary a weed in sight, approximately 15 acres. And an enormous amount of sweat labor was put into the weeding of these plants. We went out and pulled that official sample on September 29th. And in trying to be efficient and not having my folks drive those samples in from all corners of the state, we actually overnight shipped it with FedEx and it did not arrive on September 30th. So um, I myself went out and resampled that field the following day. I call that the panic resample on October 1st. And we ran that and the THC content was 0.37. So again, just eked under Everybody breathed a sigh of relief at this point in time. True to form, Murphy's Law. Suddenly, that sample popped back up um, that was taken on the 29th, 
and we decided to live dangerously and test it, keeping in mind that the Certificate of Analysis, or COA, the test result had already been officially issued for 0.37% THC. When we ran that, that first test, the September 29th test, we discovered it actually came in at 0.44%. So that would have been actually very bad. Um, that producer would have had the opportunity to request a retest of that sample, um, but that doesn't mean that it necessarily would have come out below 0.39% and that entire 15 acres would have been destroyed. The producer also pulled their own sample and sent it to a private lab where that lab reported it as being 0.25% THC. So what I'm actually highlighting here is, I think, another reoccurring theme of the 2020 season was I believe there is a serious lack of stable, uniform genetics in the hemp world right now for the production of cannabidiol. Uh, when I walk into a field, and you can even see it in this picture, you're seeing different phenotypes. Um, I don't believe that these are uniform by any means, and if they're not uniform, they are not performing the same in terms of THC and CBD content out in that field. Another issue that I think we have yet to fully grapple here in the state of Iowa is how to control pollen flow. Obviously, that production of cannabidiols are the number one target crop right now for hemp. And again, the industry standard is that those plants should not be pollinated. With that being said, research has shown that pollen can move 15, some say 25 or more miles. So Iowa is either blessed or cursed with a lot of feral ditchweed across the state. Think to yourselves, where could I find a location in Iowa where I'm not within 15 or 25 mile radius of that feral hemp and that then cross or pollinating my crop when I either don't want it to be pollinated or I want it to be, I don't want it to be cross-pollinated with an unknown variable. We've got a lot of wild area. We've got a lot of ditches. Um, it is common to see that hemp everywhere. And I don't know going forward how we are going to grow high quality cannabidiol in the state of Iowa that doesn't have seed. Here is a picture from Eastern Iowa in the rolling hills, and you can see how much land out there is not cropped um, and probably has a decent amount of feral cannabis growing. But what you're actually looking at is supposedly two different varieties planted side by side. You can see the different um, rows going two different directions. But as you look across that, look at the phenotypes that you're seeing out in that field. Do we think that that is a uniform, consistent base genetic that is producing plants that are photocopies of one another? I would say no, that that is not happening. In Iowa, we are so accustomed to corn and soybeans that literally do look like a photocopy of the plant beside it. Um, I am not seeing that in hemp. It is just all over the board. Again, what's the genetic uniformity here? This is supposed to be the same variety. There are probably different soil types at play on this fairly steep hill that used to be a cattle lot. And so there could be some different responses to the environment. But even so, I'm not seeing what I would call a uniform crop. And I can't help but point this out. Um, I talked a little bit before about the instance where we had FedEx that either sat on or misplaced um, one of our official samples for a day. And this was not unique to the state of Iowa. It happened all across the country. So when you box hemp up, I don't know how I can adequately tell you with enough emphasis how much odor is associated with hemp. And it smells exactly like marijuana. Um, this was a shipment. This was a legal shipment that was um, being shipped out of the state of the Iowa. Just last week, it was brought to the post office. It didn't um, get there in time to go out in the mail that day. And so it stayed in a small town Iowa post office overnight. So the next day, when people reported for work, that post office smelled to high heaven and back again of marijuana. And so law enforcement was called. And this is what they found when they opened up the box. And I, I actually marked out the label to uh, save the innocence 
of those involved. Um, and what we found was hemp in Ziploc bags. And I can attest that a Ziploc bag is no order barrier for that very distinctive smell. Additionally, when people are packaging up those bags, they get, the, they, they get that residue on their hands and then they handle the outside of the bag. So even if you have a foolproof way of packaging it up so that the odors are contained, if you have residue on your hands and you touch those packages, that is enough to set off a drug dog. And so between the post office and pretty much all of the private carriers, there were instances where drug dogs that were working in hubs pulled those packages off the line or just by the sheer amount of odor coming out of them, they were pulled off the line for follow-up. The one thing that is wrong with this mailing is the required paperwork or documentation was not included. Anytime hemp is moving in Iowa, you need to have a copy of your hemp license or permit, and you need to have a copy or copies of that certificates of analysis or test results. And those are really, really important because first, the law requires you to have those. But second of all, on those, it contains contact information for the grower and it contains contact information for the Iowa Department of Agriculture and a phone number that will be answered 24-7. So if law enforcement pulls this box, they start to look into it, they can see who to contact at the Iowa Department of Agriculture, they can do that, and then I can confirm to them that yes, they really are a, a hemp licensee in the state of Iowa. Yes, that COA is valid, it has not been doctored. Um, and then additionally, if you are moving hemp for the purpose of transferring ownership, you also need a bill of lading in it. So. This shipment was hung up for several days because they had not included any of that paperwork in it. So law enforcement was at a loss for who to contact. Eventually they did get to me and I could attest to all of it. Furthermore, law enforcement now does have a quick test that they can do in the field that does not with great certainty tell you it's hemp or not, but it basically tells you if it has more than 1% THC. Um, Good quality marijuana these days is far above 0.39% THC. So that quick test will at least give them a quick idea if they're dealing with marijuana being shipped under the guise of hemp, or it really is more in that hemp line of THC content. I have to tell you, after we lost one of our packages and I talked to people across the country about losing packages because of the smell, uh, we were turned on to vacuum sealers. And so very quickly, all of my field people got their very own vacuum sealer. And so we, um, when we took an official sample, it went into a paper bag because it's pretty wet material. It was then vacuum sealed um, at least once, sometimes twice, with putting gloves on in between so that we weren't tracking that residue to the outside of the package. Once we started doing that, we did not have shipping issues, not saying that it's not possible. Um, but that is what we did. And this is what I'm recommending to Iowa growers if they are looking to mail samples through the mail to really seriously take a look at vacuum sealers. And in fact, um, we were shipping through FedEx and because of the level of odor of our packages, we were asked to not come back to one of the FedEx locations again because that smell was then sticking to other people's packages and they got a lot of complaints. So it's the little things in life with hemp that turn out to be the big things in ways that you just never thought you would have to deal with. Quick review, we keep talking about all these different hemp crops in Iowa, but what is actually legal use in Iowa? Right now, there are no hemp products that are approved for animal feed. That actually requires an approval, any ingredient in a, whether it be a, a food or a medication, requires approval by the FDA and the feed control officials. And so there are uh, research packages that are moving through the re that approval process right now. Um, it takes a couple of years for that full approval process and it's done on a by species basis. So it's gonna take a while before hemp is just free to go into any type of animal feed. From a human consumption standpoint, um, according to the FDA, there are only three legal products. And that is, um, I call it hemp hearts. That's usually what it's called in grocery stores. Many people call it hemp seed, but the reality is it's, it's hemp grain because it's for consumption. 
or the oil that is pressed from that grain, or if you want to call it seed, and finally, protein powder from that grain. So those are the three um, generally recognized as safe hemp products that can be used for human consumption. However, here in the state of Iowa, that house file that was signed in June of 2020 does make human consumption legal. The Department of Inspections and Appeals here in Iowa has a rule package that will become effective in early March that outlines the processing, uh, manufacture, and retail sale of those products for human consumption. So if you are looking at making anything that's intended for human consumption, I strongly urge you to get in touch soon so that we can get you hooked up with what those requirements are. Medical cannabidiol is legal here in the state of Iowa and under certain circumstances and purchased from only very specific um, locations. And finally, cosmetics are legal. Again, you have to say under the THC content of 0.3, um, and you cannot make any medicinal claims on it. So you can't market a lotion that's gonna make your knee feel better because of you have arthritis issues. So looking at the experience in 2020, as well as my interactions with other states, um, let me give you my unsolicited advice. Number one, you have to know what you're growing first and foremost. Grain, seed, fiber, cannabidiol, don't grow smokable, it's illegal. Number two, I feel strongly about it. I feel so strongly it gets yellow stars. You need to get a contract to sell before you plant. You need to make sure that that money goes into escrow and doesn't disappear before you get it harvested and delivered. You need to understand your payment details, how long it will take to get paid, what you're going to get paid on. Um, you, may, you need to make a decision on tolls versus splits. So when you deliver that biomass for extraction for cannabidiols, you may get charged on a per pound basis, that's a toll charge, or it may be a split where they say, I'm keeping 50% of what we extract and you get the other 50% that you then still have to market. You need to understand all of this up front. You need to understand from your purchaser what they're gonna test you for and what their action levels are on heavy metals, molds, pesticide residue, and understand what happens if you exceed those levels, what's gonna happen to the value of your crop. When I say get a contract, I don't mean get one for free online. Um, in speaking with an attorney in Wisconsin who specializes in this, he said most contracts can be written for one to $2,000. But if you don't have a contract, you get into a dispute with your partners, and then you look for an attorney to help you, you're looking at $20,000 before they even meet with you. So spend that money wisely on getting everything squared away up front. And if you do try and go to court, keep in mind that courts frequently look to an industry standard. And right now, this is such a new crop, there isn't an industry standard. So courts are really gonna have a hard time deciding how to proceed um, with that action. You need to know, do your processors want certified organic or are they just happy with organic-like methods? I just can't tell you enough, you need to understand your pricing schematic. At the end of the growing season, we sent out a survey to all of our licensees and we asked how many had a contract signed before you actually planted. We had three that replied that they had a contract signed before they planted and I pat them on the back. We also asked, okay, did you have a contract sign after planting but before harvest? You only had two more of the respondees that say they had a contract that was struck during that time frame. The survey was done in December, um, and so harvest had been done at least a month or two by that point in time. Zero number of the respondents said that they had found a way to contract or sell after harvest yet at that point. So you can see that the market is a really tough place at this point in time. If you wanna grow for that CBD, you really need to think hard about the amount of manual labor that's gonna go into it. You don't have any labeled pesticides Many processors do not want you to use the very few um, insecticides um, and, and fungicides that are available. So you're looking at immense manual labor on managing those pest issues. You have to look at the cost difference between transplanting those 
cuttings versus planting seed. Um, we didn't even talk today about the proper drying of the crop, but drying is another make or break action where you can grow a really good crop, but if it's not dried appropriately and it molds, you've lost everything. Since we don't have any processors in Iowa at this point in time, you have to take into consideration what it's gonna cost you to get that to those processors. Um, and I'm hearing reports of people waiting for a year from once they deliver their crop and it actually gets processed. And keeping in mind, you are likely to not get paid until it's processed and sold. So that is a long time to wait. Some processors do not wanna deal with biomass that has seed in it. So again, that pollination issue pops up. And uh, you just have to really find the buyer and understand what it is that they are gonna want in that crop. In our survey, we had um, many respondents um, tell us how they thought they would do things differently in 2021. More than once, I had people tell me they were gonna grow fewer acres um, so that they could manage it better because of the manual labor. People commented that they've gotta find a buyer earlier so that they have those goals and targets. And finally, I'm glad to see that someone said, I'm gonna start testing it by a private lab so that they can keep track of that THC content and um, pull the trigger on getting it harvested before THC goes too high. Maybe you've just heard me talk and you think to yourself, holy cow, I am not gonna grow hemp, but I'm gonna rent my land out to someone else that does. I call this stranger danger. Keep in mind, if you rent to somebody and they grow and for whatever reason, maybe they don't um, meet the THC content requirement and it has to be destroyed. If they walk away from that crop and the state of Iowa needs to then take care of that destruction, we will try and assign those costs to the licensee. But if we can't find the licensee, it will go back down and be assigned to the taxes on that land. So it could fall to the landowner in circumstances where the chips don't fall right. And I have a lot of people that will mention that they're still gonna use pesticides or they're gonna build their own processing in the back of their machine shed. And I just have to warn you that no means no. You're gonna get tested very likely for those pesticides and you're gonna get found out and your, pro your crop is gonna be maybe of little to no value at that point in time. If the Department of Inspections and Appeals finds people that are doing processing and manufacturing without the appropriate licenses. Again, you have a product that is going to be worthless um, and you have a lot invested in it at that point in time. You have to be really cautious with your inputs. That lack of genetic um, uniformity and consistency I think is a really, really big problem. And you have to be prepared for that THC failure rate. Um, I've seen reports from across the country of failures anywhere from 10 to as high as 78% of the crop, the hemp crop in a state failed because of the THC content. And then post 2020 growing season, I continue to stress that testing during the growing season, you have to know where your THC content is at and you have to keep track of pollination and if the processors are gonna be willing to purchase that seed. Never believe a salesperson. Always demand to see the lab analyses on that crop. If they make you a promise that that particular variety has never gone hot, um, I would say don't trust them and it's time to deal with somebody else. And finally, just like with a speeding ticket, you can't get out of a speeding ticket because you didn't know that the speed limit dropped in a school zone. Um, you're not gonna get out of trouble with all of the hemp regulations because you don't know the rules you are responsible for knowing all the rules as you grow. In my humble opinion, for hemp to be successful in Iowa, we're gonna need that uniform, stable genetics. Growers are gonna to have to test their hemp in season because the only way to control THC at that point in time is to harvest early. This is not like your normal crop. This is big time manual labor, possibly different equipment in a substantial manner and we have to have access to those processors. We have to have a place to, to sell locally so that it's economic for everybody involved. So with that being said, um, I strongly recommend if you are looking at getting into the hemp market or the hemp growing, 
you really need to look into a publication called Hemp Benchmarks. And no, I don't get a kickback for recommending this, but I do have an opportunity to see the monthly Hemp Benchmark reports. That is price reporting. It talks about supply. Um, this is an example from just the December um, issue report where we're talking about um, this month's rate is down 63% from a year ago in terms of a price of a particular um, hemp distillate. It is really important for people to understand where the market is at. Um, hempbenchmarks.com is where you can sign up for it. Um, I've removed some information from here, but I just want you to see that this is a chart um, of selling hemp biomass in, in different volumes. And you can see that the price reporting here started in November of 2019. And you can see that consistently the price for that hemp biomass has ticked down, ticked down, ticked down. We're not necessarily at an all-time low in all of them, but gosh darn it, we are hovering way down there. Please look into the financial side of hemp before you charge off um, unprepared. And so finally, the most popular question I think I get asked is, so are we going to have more hemp grown in Iowa in 2021? And for me, this is a game show of which I just don't even know the answer yet. So when I talk to some people, they talk about, we need a new crop in our rotation. And I'm not arguing that that's not a great concept, but the problem is, is that hemp is an oil seed, just like soybean. And so it is susceptible to many of the same insects and diseases as soybeans. Um, in those states where federal crop insurance is available, you actually cannot plant hemp after soybeans because of that issue. So if you want to put it in as a new rotation, that's great, but I think it can't just be with corn and soybeans. I have people tell me they are not going to do it again because the banker said this is too risky at this point in time. I talk to folks who say, I will make a decision about the 21 growing season once I get my 20 crop marketed. So if they can't find a buyer for their 20 crop, they're going to be hard pressed to go forward. And finally, I have a lot of people tell me that we should all grow up because it's going to replace corn and soybeans. And I'm just going to let you work that mechanics out in your head. With that, that is um, a summary of how hemp went its first year here in the state of Iowa. And I'm more than happy to take questions.